MSA committee, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be unto you. Uh, I live in Virginia in a high rise right into the middle of the Beltway in Washington, D.C. And as I got your response, I was in the elevator going to the 11th floor while my neighbor was going to the 26th floor. I entered the elevator. To me, he looked like an Arab, Middle Eastern, maybe Mexican. We look alike. <laughs> so I said, peace be unto you. So he looked at me and said, I'm not a Muslim. <laughs> so I said, does this mean that you don't take peace for a greeting? <laughs> so peace be unto you, all of you. I would like to express my uh, sincere uh, pleasure and happiness to be here. The spirit that the Father led uh, this dialogue with is very encouraging and very positive. And the entire spirit, I believe, this room is full of positive spirits all over the place. So I'm very encouraged and I'm going to take some time, maybe more minutes than I am designated. Hope not. But just if, if that happens, you know, I just foretold it. Uh, I will start with some transparencies. In fact, this will all be transparencies. So if you're bored with transparencies, maybe you want to just take a look at what we have. Please go ahead. Basically, Islam is a strange religion to the West. Islam was not properly ever introduced to the West. Islam was never sustained in any positive image that the Muslims themselves, even overseas, could present on an international level to make people accept it or think about it in a positive sense. So in a way, it is our mistake. In a way, it is us who stereotype us more than anybody else. But in another way, also misinformation through Orientalist studies and others have also contributed tremendously to the misunderstanding of Islam and the stereotyping. Tonight, there is a call, and the call is from God. If you please raise up the transparency a little bit. It says, say, O people of the book, come to common terms as between us and you, that we worship none but God, that we associate no partners with him, that we erect not from among ourselves lords and patrons other than God. If then they turn back, say ye, bear witness that we at least are Muslims. I believe this is the spirit of dialogue, the spirit of openness, that all what we have to say is what we believe. Then you just pick it from every, whatever end you like and just either discuss it, throw it back at us, or accept portions of it, or share your reflections on it. This is the spirit with which we start. Can you please go ahead? God is very difficult to understand, but not impossible. God is very difficult to understand if we try to see him because he is not a material person. He is not created. He is the creator. So seeing God with our own eyes is an impossibility. God said so. The Quran teaches us, uh, such as fear not the meeting with us for judgment say, why aren't the angels sent down to us? People wanted to see the angels eye to eye. Likewise, they wanted to see God. Uh, or else, uh, why don't we see our Lord? Indeed, they have an arrogant conceit of themselves, and mighty is the insolence of their impurity. On the day that they see the angels, no joy will there be to the sinners that day. Indeed, it is very difficult and I can let you read the rest of it. It is very difficult that the quest of man have always focused on either touching or seeing the deity. And this is what the Quran is saying, that is not possible. You can't see the deity, you will not see the deity. Likewise, the Quran teaches us verse seven and on, before thee also the apostles we sent were but men, to whom we granted an inspiration. If you realize this not, ask of those who possess the message. And nor did we give them bodies that ate no food. 
So messengers and prophets ate food. They were human beings. They were just inspired to convey the message of God. So to ask of prophets what you ask of God is to mix not only apple and orange, but the creator and the creature. This is extremely impossible according to the Quranic scriptures. Also, uh, for that reason, God has set himself as one criteria for himself, stands alone by itself, that is not shared with anybody. This is what we call divinity. The level of the deity is level of divinity and not the level of humanity. And this is where the Quran takes pain to explain the issue of the sonhood of God. Who can be the son of God, if at all? It says, He to whom belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth, no son he has begotten, nor has he a partner in his dominion. It is he who created all things and ordered them in due proportions. So when we talk about the Godhead or the divinity of the Lord, we are talking about a separate, completely independent, separate being, or at least this is the Quranic concept of who God is. Likewise, the Quran says, say praise be to God who begets no son and has no partner in his dominion, nor needs he any to protect him from humiliation, yea, magnify him for his greatness and glory. So. God does not need sons. God does not beget. He creates. And these are two different separate functions. Humans beget and others beget. Creatures beget creatures. But God creates all creatures. Uh, also, the Quran teaches us that even the jinns, when they heard the Quran, they made a statement. And they said in verse number three, and exalted is the majesty of our Lord, he has taken neither a wife nor a son. It is a very fundamental concept. While we do understand as Muslims that the biblical parables that we will be talking about, the style of presentation in the Bible, Old and New Testament, has always emphasized the metaphor. Like when people said to each other, you are God, they didn't mean that they are divine being coming from heaven but they meant they were righteous. Likewise, we understand that people, when they said, you are the children of God, or they are the children of God, that they are using a metaphor. But still, that metaphor is not appropriate for the sake of the divinity, for the sake of the divine deity, God himself. Okay, go ahead. Uh, of course, uh, here, uh, there is a claim on verse 88, if you go ahead uh, further, all the way up. The same? Sh put, put the bottom up, please. They say, God, most gracious, has begotten a son. Indeed, you have put forth a thing most monstrous. Uh, can you go ahead, please, faster? At it, the, at it the skies are ready to burst, the earth to split asunder, and the mountains to fall down in utter ruin, that they should invoke a son for God most gracious. For it is not consonant with the majesty of God most gracious that he would beget a son. The issue is not if he can. The issue is, is it consonant with the majesty of God? Is it appropriate for us to attribute a son to the deity? whether this son is a, a human or uh, somebody else. Anything that Allah created is part of his creatures. The question here is not whether God can, but it is, is it appropriate, is it consonant with the majesty of God? Go on. Uh, also here, it tells us that yet do they worship besides God things that can neither profit them nor harm them? And the misbelievers is a helper of evil against his own Lord. And uh, But thee we only sent 
to give glad tidings and admonition. And also on verse 58, a very clear distinction between who God is and who others are. God stands in one criteria. He is immortal. God is immortal. God doesn't die. So the Quran says, and put thy trust in him who lives and dies not and celebrate his praise and enough is he to be acquainted with uh, the faults of his servants. So God is not only standing alone in one criteria by himself in his divinity, in his majesty, but also he stands there, he stands there without having to meet death. God is eternal, God is immortal. So any mortal being cannot qualify to be God according to this scripture. Also, the Quran uh, takes great pain, as we can see now, to him is due the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. How can he have a son when he has no concert? He created all things, and he has full knowledge of all things. This, uh, that is God your Lord, there is no God but He, the Creator of all things, then worship you Him, and He has power to dispose of all affairs. This is the description of God according to the Quranic scripture. Here is the story of the creation of Jesus Christ. Jesus, peace be upon Him, stands to be a mighty messenger, a mighty prophet, an honored person, He and His mother, in the highest esteem, in the eyes and the minds and the hearts of Muslims. This is not something to flatter a friend who comes from a Christian tradition. This is part of the Islamic faith. If you don't believe in that, their honor, their dignity, that their place with God, then you cannot claim to be a Muslim. This is how the Quran tells us how Jesus came about. It says, remember in the book, The Story of Mary, when she took a place, I cannot see that. Can you get it a little bit in the light? I'm sorry. Okay. When she withdrew from her family to a place in the east, she placed a screen to screen herself from them. Then we sent to her our angel, and he appeared to her as a man in all respects. She said, I seek refuge from God. Uh, most gracious, come not near, if thou uh, dost fear God. He said, Nay, I am only a messenger from thy Lord to announce to thee the gift of a holy son. The word holy here can be only understood in the biblical context whereby the book of Romans says every male that opens the womb will be called holy to the Lord. So it is only a title for male kids. But in that context still it is not really the most accurate translation and I can ask uh, Father uh, Burl to, to explain this in Arabic even I know that he can do that. Zakiya means purified. It doesn't mean really holy in a divine context. But in any way, uh, it says, She said, How shall I have a son, seeing that no man has touched me, and I'm not unchaste? He said, So it will be. The Lord said so. That is easy for me. And we wish to appoint him as a sign unto men and a mercy from us. At length she carried, she conceived the baby, and she carried him to a place that's remote. And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She cried in her anguish, Ah, would that I had died before this! Would that I had been a thing forgotten and out of sight! But a voice cried to her from beneath the palm tree, Grieve not, for thy Lord has provided a rivulet beneath thee, and shake towards thyself the trunk of the palm tree, it will let fall fresh ripe dates upon thee. So eat and drink and cool thine eye, and if thou dost see any man say, I have vowed a fast today, so that I would not speak to any human being. So she brought the baby to her people, they said, carrying him in her arms. They said, O Mary, truly an amazing thing thou hast brought. O sister of Aaron, and sister of Aaron is a metaphor, like we say, the brother in faith and the sister in faith. It is not a, a, a blood lineage. It is the sister of faith. O sister of Aaron, what amazing thing thou hast just brought. Uh, thy father was not a man of evil, nor thy mother 
a woman unchaste. But she pointed to the baby. She said, he, they said, how can we talk to one who's a child in the cradle? He said, I'm indeed a servant of God. He has given me revelation and made me a prophet, and he has made me blessed wheresoever I be. Can we skip until we get to, can we keep skipping? I want us to use some time for the rest of the references, please. Uh, go ahead, skip it. We'll play skip it for some time. Okay, here it says, the similitude of Jesus before God is as that of Adam. He created him from dust, then said to him, be, and he was. This is the word. This is the word that the Quran refers to as the word of creation. The word of creating anything. God says to it, be, and it is. It doesn't take a second. It doesn't take help. It doesn't take any support. He just said it. This is the creative word of God by which Adam was created from no father, no mother. Eve was created from someone like a father, but no mother. Everyone else from a father and a mother. Here comes the fourth possible probability whereby God creates somebody from a mother and no father but his word. His word was the power that he created Jesus with. Go ahead. Also, uh, here is a declaration of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle of God and his word which he bestowed on Mary as a spirit pre and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in God and his apostles, say not Trinity, desist, it will be better for you, for God is one, glory be to him, far exalted he above having a son. To him belong all things in the heavens and on earth, and enough is God as a disposer of all affairs. And then it goes on to say, Christ disdains not to serve and worship God. And in fact, the Bible attests to that. This is not only a Quranic claim upon Jesus. Jesus worshiped God. Jesus prayed to God. Jesus cried talking to God. Jesus asked God for things. And God responded to him. So when the Quran says, Jesus Christ does not disdain to worship God, it is just a declaration of the fact, not something that is to be attributed to him after the fact. It is his life. His entire life was a worship of God. Uh, I think we skip it. Now we will go with some other references that as part of my learning myself and as I really came to this country, I have taken time uh, meeting with friends, sharing in the interfaith dialogue, being part of the interfaith conference in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, that the Bible is an important book. The Bible is not totally discounted by Muslim as, uh, you know, a total corrupt book and stuff like this. Muslims look at the Bible as a book that originally came from heaven to Jesus Christ. But the Bible as it stands today is another issue to speak about. But the origin of the book in essence is something that Muslims believe in. Jesus did not speak of his own, he spoke of revelation that he got from God as we will see. Uh, this first page, and I think that this is a bigger writing and type print for you to read much more than the one uh, we had before. Uh, the first page is talking about emphasizing the fact that the Bible did not necessarily always speak in a straight language. The Bible spoke most of the time in parables, especially when Jesus spoke. At the time, he was afraid of what's going to happen to him. The Jews were picking, nitpicking, in fact, on him and his moves and his talks and everything. So the Bible emphatically said that things were mentioned in parables. And you can read several things in this regard. Those verses are just a few. And the next page also emphasizes the same thing, that the Bible spoke in parables. We can skip this one. The Bible teaches us also that no man has ever seen God. No man has ever seen the deity. 
John 1.18, as you can see, says, No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made Him known, which means told us who God is, as Jesus told us who God is. John 4.12, uh, 4, first epistle of John, it says, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is perfect in us. Also, the Bible teaches us that man is not God. It is a very strong, powerful declaration from the Bible. It says, the Egyptians are human and not God. This is a declaration of the Bible, that a human is not God. Likewise, in the book of Isaiah, uh, now the Egyptians are men and not God. It is a very powerful declaration again. Also, the book of Hezekiah tells us, Morton, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, yet you are but a mortal and no God. So if you're mortal, you're not God. If you're God, you're immortal. Also, in Ezekiel, uh, the New International Version uses another uh, explanation. It says, but you are a man and not a God. So if you are a man, you're not a God. Next, Ezekiel, also in King James Version, it says, Thou art a man and not God. So man is not God. Likewise, the Bible teaches us that God is not a man. And this is also as powerful when it comes from the Bible. It says, God is not a human being. Why does the Bible say that God is not a human being? because God is not a human being and they are not the same they are not they are not to be mixed or confused with each other that he should lie or immortal that he should change his mind has he promised and will he not do it has he spoken and will he not fulfill it of course he would in the book of numbers God is not a man again emphasizing the fact that we should not mix identities we should not mix entities we should keep them as they are the creator stands alone and the creature stands to be the servant of the creator when the bible compares the human purity versus the divinity of god the bible comes with a very uh, astounding really contrast it says how then can a man be righteous before god how can one born of women be pure when we want to attribute divinity to any human being, the Bible is asking, how can a man be as pure in comparison to God? Even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less man who is but a maggot and the son of man who is only a worm. If we compare the best human being, the best creature has ever walked the earth to God, we are all worms. How did God reveal things to us or reveal himself to us? The Bible teaches us that God did the revelation in several forms. One is he revealed his word through the proclamation uh, with which I have been entrusted by the command of God. He has revealed himself, as Isaiah goes, it says, he has revealed himself in my ears. Again, these are words not the person of God. Also, in the uh, Gospel of Luke, uh, he has revealed, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Talking about the revelation of the word of God. John 9, 3, it says, He was born blind so that God is works might be revealed in him so also it is not that only words come from heaven but works as well come from God as he cures the blind as he cures the leper as he br brought from death to life by God as well all of that is the work of God uh, in the book of Daniel but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries so things that are hidden can also be revealed by God. 
Amos tells us uh, who forms God forms the mountains, creates the wind, reveals his thoughts to mortals. When God thinks of something that's good for us, he reveals it to us and he says to us what it is that we need to do. Also, uh, Genesis tells us, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. By Moses talking to Pharaoh, God has made his revelation known to Pharaoh. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us. It becomes our responsibility when God speaks to us. Uh, uh, the book of Exodus, they said, the God of the Hebrews has revealed himself to us. Let us go a three days journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God, or he will fall upon us with pestilence or sword. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us, and instead of revealed himself in uh, the new in the national version, it says he has met with us. In King James it says, has met with us. So meeting with us, meeting us, revealing himself to us, have been used exchangeably to mean the same thing. Also, uh, the first book of Samuel says, a man of God came to Eli and said to him, thus the Lord has said, I revealed myself to the family of your ancestor in Egypt when they were slaves to the house of Pharaoh. And also, the same book, it says, did I not clearly reveal myself? Or did I not plainly appear to? Did, uh, in the same, uh, the New Revised uh, Standard Version, didn't yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to him. So in all of these revelations, you see either God is word, or God is work being revealed to humans. I want to skip this to get to the next page. In Isaiah 45, they, then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we're talking about word revelation. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. We're talking about work revelation. For that can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Work of God. Uh, ever since the book of Romans, ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made, the work of God. Now, when Jesus... Uh, was spoken of it was spoken of here for there is one God and there is also one mediator between God and humankind Christ Jesus human himself this is what the new revised uh, standard version says King James says God and men the, the mediator is the man Jesus Christ Jesus uh, the New International Version says the mediator between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. Can we skip? Uh, we look at the book of Romans. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory. These are, th we're talking here about the, the, the Hebrew Jewish people who rejected Jesus Christ. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions, their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. 
they were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, uh, covet covetousness, malice, uh, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanders, God-haters, insolent, all of the list goes on. Can we skip the next one? Get to page 11, please. Then the book of Acts tells us, can we go one more page before, I'm sorry? I skipped this one. The book of Acts, verses 17, 24 and on, it reads, the God who made the world, and this is a very beautiful description of God. This is an eloquent description. The God who made the world and everything in it, who, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the, place, of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our beings as even some of your own poets have said for we too are his office spring since we are god's office spring we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals so whatever we people imagine the deity to be the bible is saying it is not what you think it is the deity is not what we think. The deity stands alone to be a mystery. Nobody can grasp the deity of God. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Uh, the second chronicle tells us, but will God indeed reside with mortals on earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain him. How much less this house that I have built. The Hosea uh, says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Uh, Matthew said, Blessed is that slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. So work is very important. Psalms 74, it says, Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you let those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. I think I'm going to skip the rest because I, I think I exceeded my time. And I'm sorry if I did because I'm sorry I, I forgot to get my watch with me. So if I exceeded my time, I do apologize. And I really thank you for your patience. And I want to say a word, I hope, because that was not the intention, that I did not misuse the book of people whom I respect, and I respect dearly, people of the book, as ordered and commanded by my book, that I should give regard and respect to people of the book, namely the Jews and the Christians in particular. Uh, so I wish I did not uh, say anything offensive or inappropriate, and I wish that our communication will continue. Thank you again for, our, for your patience, and I appreciate the opportunity. Wassalamu alaikum. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the issue of the divinity of God versus the divinity of Jesus is one of the hot points, the hot potato issues really between Muslims and Christians. And as Father said it rightly so, we cannot resolve it in a session, we cannot resolve it over such a forum even. But I am very open and very encouraged to sit down some other time and talk about it in details. Get the Bible, get the Quran, because this is learning. It is learning for me, it's learning, I believe, for everybody. But I believe that it is much more a serious issue to be just, you know, shrugged in a way that it is something that we should take our life to explore and examine. Examining is what is important because what is at stake here is everybody's destiny. Every one of us has a destiny, and in that destiny comes the importance of investigating that issue, 
examining it with an open mind and open heart and see where God leads everyone. But I'm encouraged and I'm hopeful that at least this was such a scratching of the surface for everybody. And tonight is only one night. And we do have, I hope, more than one night and more than, you know, more than one year, hopefully so, that we can reflect. This is the essence of coming together. And this is the essence of the verse I used in the beginning. Come on, O people of the book, together on one term, that we erect not patrons and lords from amongst ourselves, that we do not worship each other, that we do not worship anybody besides or in lieu of God. This is the essence of it. Jesus worshiped God, we want to worship God. He called God, God for himself in the book of John as Jesus, one of his last utterings as he met Mary Magdalene in John 20, 17. He was saying what? As she came to kiss his hands and feet, what did he say? He said, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and tell them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my Lord and your Lord, to my God and your God. If he called him God, why don't we investigate that relationship as Jesus wanted us to understand it? Thank you very much. Maybe in addition to that, to the Sufi approach, is the practical approach that we master. We are material people. We have the material side of us, we have the spiritual side of us. You feed one and forget the other, you limp, you walk limping. So we need to attach that material side of us to God, whereby we account that when we earn our living, we really earn it right. When we spend our money, we put it where it belongs. When we deal with people, we deal them as gifts from God that God gave and put them in our way. So if we turn this life into an ethical life, we will feel the pleasure of believing in God only if we do it in response to his call, not just as a human uh, caring for another human, but in response to the call of God, if we manage our life financially, ethically, and all aspects according to the revelation, then and only then we'll have the pleasure and the power to always re-guide ourselves with the guidance of God and be always consistent with his teachings. There are two things to mention. One is no human can guarantee any human anything. <laughs> That's right. Even the insurance company cannot. That's right. <laughs> But there is a promise that came to us from God, whereby he said, both in the Gospel and in the Quran, if you believe in God, if you work the work that he says you should, you are guaranteed heaven with God. Which means you're also guaranteed the opposite if you don't. <laughs> so you have guarantees on both ways. <laughs> God, as said in the Bible, is not God of confusion. God is about guidance. God is about goodness. God is about the light that man needs from heaven to guide him through his journey on earth. So God is not about confusion. What happened is, and I have to go some time before the apostles' time, I have to go to Jesus himself. Jesus said in the Gospel, there are so many things to tell you talking to the apostles before he left them but you cannot bear them now you cannot bear them for i must go for the comforter to come for he will tell you the whole truth for he will only speak in the name of god or the name of my father whatever metaphor he used and he will declare to you the whole truth for he will not speak of himself but that which he hears that he will speak in this verse Jesus is talking about someone that should come after Jesus departs right for I must go for the comforter to come so he was saying 
I need to leave for somebody else to come. I understand that my Christian theologians interpret this to mean the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit came, she covered all the Christian community with the Holy Spirit and filled it with, you know, the, the, the divine Spirit of God. There is a problem, however, with that understanding, as far as I'm concerned. The problem is that the Holy Spirit was there when Jesus was born, when Jesus was baptized, when Jesus was doing everything. He said in the Gospel, if it was not by the finger of God that I cast out demons, who was helping him? It was God through the Holy Spirit. Okay. So the Holy Spirit was never absent. And there is also another question to ask. If Jesus had things to say that the disciples could not bear, and whoever comes had to tell him to the disciples, what are those things that the Holy Spirit said that Jesus could not? That is also another question. Much more so is in question if Jesus had known or wanted to tell people that there would be no prophet after him, why does he take pain to declare and describe false prophets after him? As he said, beware of false prophets, right? For they will speak in my name, they will preach in my name, they will teach in my name, they will even heal in my name, right? If Jesus knew there would be no prophets after him, it's easy. No prophets after me, period. But since he had warned about false prophets, that leaves us with one possibility. Either that a true prophet is coming, or more than one true prophet is coming. So I believe that Jesus did not leave confusion. Jesus left a very clear message. It is only that people who fought each other for centuries about what about the identity of Jesus Christ and God saw it fit to send another book and I'm doing this at the expense of saying he's preaching but I didn't intend to but the question really forces me to explain that God never left confusion Jesus prayed to God to give him guidance he received it he mentioned it to people he declared the truth he declared the glory that God gave him. People confused the message, the origin of the message, with the messenger. And Jesus did not want people to do that. It was people, not Jesus. It was not God. It was people who confused the message, I believe. And I'm sorry for taking that much time. Yeah. Uh, there is a verse in the Quran that's worth sharing to explain this. The verse says, and by the soul and the one who created it and then gave it the inclination to righteousness and that to wickedness successful indeed the one who purifies it and failure indeed the one who indulges it in Arabic we're told in the Quran that we are created from both ends of the world from earth where the body comes and from heaven where the soul comes and they are in constant struggle the soul wants to reach the highest of heavens and the body wants to reach the lowest of the earth or most of what earth can offer and between that struggle comes faith to guide us to God and this is where a faithful person is really uh, kind of like distinct in behavior in action from people who are not as uh, faithful or do not know God at all. Well, basically, uh, any religion would call somebody who leaves it either a heretic or apostate, whatever name you call it. No, no, no. We, we've got special terms for that, but that's okay. <laughs> we, we, we say they lost their faith. <laughs> what a loss. <laughs> uh, in Islam, Although there is a perceived consensus that an apostate is an outcast in the community because Islam does not formulate itself by the opinion of the community, 
that is not to say that the community doesn't have an opinion as to what should go on, but wherever God speaks, we listen. Wherever there is a revelation, we just go with the revelation. And this may be a big difference in approach to the religion, whereby in Christianity, by and large, the church can change what is perceived over the time. In Islam, the text has the highest degree of authenticity, whereby it is the only scripture, if I may boost for a minute, <laughs> it is the only scripture that is written it is in it is original language from the beginning, reviewed by the Prophet, dictated by the Prophet, and was kept in one book between two covers during his life. No Prophet before him has seen the book attributed to them except the Ten Commandments by Moses. Jesus didn't see the Bible, Moses didn't see the Tower as we know it today. So when Muslims say the Quran said so, uh, as you know, the Father made it very clearly, do not compare the Quran and the Bible in that regard as to how we deal with the text uh, in, inside our religion. So for Muslims, where Allah SWT says something, we take it. Where He doesn't say anything, we think about it. You know, we determine there is democracy. But only after the, there is an exhaustion of means to detect if there is any guidance from heaven. Basically because we believe that God is guidance, it's better for us than our own. So where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, those, you have no problem with people who do not kill you, people who do not drive you out of your own homes or fight you in religion, to be kind to them. Using the word that is used between kids and parents, to be kind to them. Okay? Only those who fight you in religion and drive you out of your own homes that you are allowed, you know, to fight. So I think it's fair. I think Islam is very fair if you study it. But the concepts that are really made out of context, like if I measure Christianity according to Quran, here is my presentation. Okay? Likewise, if you measure the Quran from a Christian biblical uh, concept, you will tear it apart because that is not the context of the book. But I am using my references to say this. The person who leaves the Islamic religion is regarded as an apostate, okay? But Muslim scholars, despite the perceived conception of the, the, the existence of consist, uh, consensus, there is no consensus on what to do with this. There is some disagreements whereby people say, if he doesn't fight you, if he doesn't conspire against Islam, if he doesn't defame Islam, leave him alone. So there is that principle also that some Muslim scholars like Abu Hanifa, for example, adapt to. They say uh, about the hadith, the famous hadith, the one who leaves his religion and fights back the community, disputes with the community. This is a person that you have to really discipline. But others who just leave it silently and depart, uh, Abu Hanifa says, leave them alone. So there is not that very much perceived consensus, although the consensus or, or the majority of opinions is, no, they must be disciplined in general. It doesn't matter how, but there must be discipline. Oh, I forgot to say something. <laughs> if this problem is solved, would this take care of? Yeah, that does Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the question of salvation, because it's very important, could not have been left without some guidance. And as far as I read the Quran, everybody who lived as a Jew before the advent of Jesus Christ will be saved. Likewise, everybody who lived as a Christian before the advent of Prophet Muhammad is fine. Those who are also living as Christians after the advent of Prophet Muhammad and not knowing anything about him, you know, they are also as fine. The problem is, it is not me. It is not my belief. It's not my insistence or persistence. It is what God said to me in the Quran as he said to Jesus in the Gospel as he said to Moses. If a prophet is sent with clear evidence 
everybody has to answer to God. And here I stop. I cannot send anybody, you know, including myself, anywhere. I can only send myself home. No heaven, no hell. I can just hope that God would accept my work. And as the verse says, if they say no or turn away, we say at least bear witness that we are Muslims, that we have shared what we have, and we hope that all of this gathering will go to heaven. Amen. Amen. This is a problem with the overuses of metaphor sure. in the Old Testament and the New sure. Testament, whereby the talk about God is talk like about human. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Quran, as, as I mentioned before, uh, God is set on a different plane. He is in heaven. That is not that he is far, but it is that he is his own unique one. He's not like anybody else. So he didn't need to rest. He didn't take six days of our time or six days of his time. He took six days. That is what he said. What six days? I really don't know. Because the day on earth is 24 hours and maybe some seconds. They are not telling us exactly. So days for God are not days for humans. And for God, time is finished. You know, everything has happened already. For God, the day of judgment is there. For God, everybody's destiny is not only known, but everybody is in his destiny for God. God has seen the whole thing. So we talk about creation of the beginning of the world. That doesn't take a second for God. It takes the creative word of be and it was but the uh, the essence of mentioning the days in fact is to illustrate for us human as father mentioned that things for us will take time and our time is different and in fact there are verses in the Quran that says that a day with your Lord can count like 50,000 days of your own so did he create it in 300,000 days I don't think so